Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I would like to give you the second part of the gross pathology of the respiratory tract of swine lecture, which will include bacterial diseases, some helminth diseases, and a few other diseases of note. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those colleagues who have graciously provided me those images either directly or through online collections and have allowed me to put these lectures together. Our first entity is a classic. Look at the crisp lines separating the atelectic consolidated cranioventral lungs of a lobe from the normal lungs in back. This is a bacterial condition caused by Mycoplasma hyopneumoniae, which is known by the name porcine enzootic pneumonia, or colloquially as thumps. This is a high morbidity, low mortality disease of grower finishing pigs, especially four to six months of age. While Mycoplasma hyopneumoniae doesn't kill many pigs, it does leave them immunosuppressed with an increased susceptibility to secondary infections by other bacterial agents, including Pastorella multocida, Truparella pyogenes, Haemophilus streptococcus, and Bordetella bronchoseptica. It may be preceded by the viral agents we talked about in the first lecture, including swine influenza, porcine circovirus, or PERS, the arterivirus that causes porcine respiratory and reproductive syndrome. Look at the very crisp line between the affected lung and the unaffected lung. And this is very common for porcine enzootic pneumonia. In many lectures, we've talked about mycoplasma and how mycoplasma is one of those bacteria that want nothing more out of life than to be a cilium. So it heads immediately in the body to organs in which it can lie among the cilia and dream of being one. And that would include the airways, the middle ears, and some parts of the reproductive tract. When mycoplasma hits the airways of the lung in pigs, it firmly adheres to the ciliary of the respiratory tree resulting initially in ciliostasis and then an influx of neutrophils into the tracheobronchial mucosa. At this point, those neutrophils will result in great damage to the mucociliary escalator and deciliation of the respiratory tract, which makes it very difficult for these animals to cough up any type of exudate. Over time, due to the elaboration of superantigens by mycoplasma, we get the very characteristic features of BALT hypoplasia which is followed by the influx of macrophages and more cells into those airways, loss of elastin and bronchiectasis, and eventually spillover of this exudate into the surrounding airways and alveoli. These generally become chronic infections for the life of the pig and are very characteristic and common when you see them. Here we are once again looking at polycerositis or Glasser's disease with abundant fibrin in the potential spaces including the pericardial space and here on the pleura. We've already talked extensively about polycerositis and its potential to cause disease and fibrin deposition in potential spaces including the thorax, abdomen, meninges, and joints. The condition may be worsened by other opportunistic pathogens, including viral agents that we've already talked about. And this may worsen the, con the disease in the pig, as well as the potential for transmissibility to humans who keeps pig. This is has been well documented in Southeast Asia, where pigs are an important part of the economy. Strep suis type 2 in these areas is the most common cause of meningitis in humans due to close contact between humans and pigs. 
And when other agents come in, like the arterivirus that causes porcine respiratory and reproductive system, it not only worsens the outbreaks of strepsuis in the pigs themselves, but the numbers of cases in humans who attend the pigs goes way up. One more note on Glasser's disease, as I believe I've spent an inordinate amount of time in this series of lectures talking about it. But not every case of Glasser's disease is going to show the amount of fibrin that has been demonstrated in most of the pictures that I've shown you. Here's a case of Haemophilus parasuus. And note that there are only a couple of strands of fibrin clinging to the pleura here. And you may see this in cases of polycerositis. The lung itself is markedly distended. It is not collapsed. It is extremely congested, probably likely to the amount of vascular damage, which is caused by haemophilus, hemorrhage, and maybe some fibrin inside the alveoli. But the pleural covering is almost devoid. If you see changes in the lung and just a couple of strands of fibrin, I still want you to include polycerositis or Glasser's disease on the list because they're not always full of fibrin. Let's move on to a disease that still causes significant economic impact and loss of pigs around the world, and that is actinobacillus pleuronemoniae. This is one of the most common and important respiratory diseases of growing pigs. And the organism is, is a devastating hemolytic gram-negative cacobacillary rod, which is highly host-specific for swine. All ages of swine are susceptible, and there is a great variation in the course of disease from peracute diseases in which animals like this one here show a marked fever up to 106 degrees, severe respiratory distress and dyspnea, which progresses to cyanosis of the skin on the nose, ears, and legs. In these peracute cases, there is high mortality with, even without premonitory signs. Here's what the lungs look like in an acute case of actinobacillosis. There is no other disease of the lungs in pigs that looks this terrible. The lesions may be anywhere in the lung, but they tend to be more in the dorsocaudal areas with concentration around major bronchi near the hilus. Histologically, these lesions look very much like you would imagine them grossly. Tremendous devastation in the lung with hemorrhage, necrosis, the formation of oat cells like you would see in a bad case of shipping fever, tremendous fibrin exudation due to vascular damage and exudation of fibrin not only onto the surface of the lungs, but within the lymphatics and the interstitial spaces as well. This agent has four different cytotoxins, which it uses as virulence factors, which cause cytolysis of neutrophils, macrophages, erythrocytes, and epithelial cells. It also has, being a gram-negative, a potent lipopolysaccharide. And this endotoxin causes systemic effects, as well as inducing activation of macrophages within the lung and secretions of chemotactins for neutrophils to bring in cells to cause more damage. It also results in activity in a procoagulant faction as well as complement activation. So it's an extremely dangerous bacteria with a wide array of armaments to cause damage to the lungs, resulting in the high morbidity we associate with this disease. And here is one that has progressed even farther. And you can see hemorrhage throughout the, the lung, which I want you to interpret as areas of necrosis. Remember, when we see hemorrhage, the vast, vast majority of conditions, we're actually looking at necrosis. So train yourself, when you see hemorrhage, to think 
necrosis instead. There is fibrin exudation on the surface of the lung and there is likely blood tinge fluid within the thoracic cavity. It is not difficult to imagine how this particular bacteria can cause epizootics of respiratory disease and death in infected, especially infected naive herds. Animals that survive often become carriers for life and areas of necrosis may be walled off by fibrous connective tissue and leave these chronic lesions behind which are referred to as sequestrums. These irregular yellow lines are combinations of degenerate uh, inflammatory cells as well as fibrous connective tissue. If the body can't beat the bug, it's going to wall it off. And you can see this in chronic cases, especially those who have been treated heavily with antibiotics. This is not the only agent that might cause a lesion like this. This might also be seen in Haemophilus parasuus, and a sequela would be extensive fibrosis within the thorax and the abdominal cavities. Another agent that may leave a lesion like this and another especially bad actor is Actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae's bad cousin, Actinobacillus suis. This bacteria is different than Actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae because it spreads in a septicemic fashion throughout the body, whereas Actinobacillus concentrates its damage in the lungs. Actinobacillus suis has many of the same cytotoxic factors that pleural pneumonia does and causes damage in many organs. You can see lesions in the lung, the liver, lymph nodes, joints, and many other things. And it somewhat resembles erysipelas from a gross point of view due to its septicemic nature. Here are the lesions caused by actinobacillus suis in the lungs. Note the multifocal embolic pattern, the areas of consolidation with separation, but it is not a generalized hem necrohemorrhagic lesion like we see with actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae. It can in some cases, in some individuals it can look like this, but this is a bit more characteristic for the septicemic actinobacillus suis. One of the other interesting things that you will see with actinobacillus suis, especially in the lymph nodes, is a predilection to cause granulomatous inflammation due to the recruitment of macrophages. And in areas where you have a lot of macrophages, like an infected lymph node, the agent will often be surrounded by splendora hopley material which makes it very easy to find these radiating eosinophil club-shaped aggregates of antigen antibody complexes. And within that complex, if you put a gram stain on it, you will be able to visualize the gram-negative actinobacillus suis. While this could be actinobacillus suis, these multifocal areas of hemorrhage in the lungs and throughout this animal's body, in the skin as well, are due to our friend Erysipelothrix ruseopathi, a gram-positive, a little different, but it's a gram-positive organism that causes septicemia, thrombosis, and infarction. And one of those conditions that with a good gram stain, you can often demonstrate the presence of the bacteria within these areas of necrosis and hemorrhage. Here is another embolic pneumonia with areas of multifocal necrosis and hemorrhage due to Salmonella cholera suis. Don't sleep on Salmonella cholera suis because this host adapted coliform gets into the bloodstream, travels around the body, and causes endotoxin mediated thrombosis, hemorrhage, and infarction in many areas, days before it causes a characteristic 
diarrhea, and fibrinonecrotic enteritis. While well, those five agents we've just talked about are more important, there are a couple of other agents that will cause pneumonia in pigs, and we should at least mention them. Remember those two agents that caused atrophic rhinitis, Bordetella bronchoseptica and Pasteurella multocida type D? They can also cause infection in the lower respiratory tract and often combine with other agents to cause a rip-roaring pneumonia, even if they can't do it uh, by themselves. Here we have a case of pneumonia as a result of Bordetella bronchoseptica where we tend to view Bordetella bronchoseptica as a fairly mild pathogen involved in atrophic rhinitis or kennel cough in dogs. It actually can be an extremely potent pathogen and has a number of toxins in the member, members of the repeats and toxin family which can cause some significant damage. It also has a tracheal cytotoxin which causes ciliostasis and the dermal necr necrotic toxin, which causes lesions in the upper respiratory tract, can do the same in the lower respiratory tract as well, being both cytotoxic and vasoconstrictive. You can isolate Bordetella bronchoseptica as a cause of pneumonia in a wide variety of species, and it is well known as a major cause of fatal pneumonia in guinea pigs. This case of pneumonia is due to that other very common pathogen found in the upper respiratory tract of swine, Pasteurella multocida. It's usually seen in concert with other components of the PRTC and rarely causes diseases in the lungs by itself. However, piglets may be affected by a primary pasteurellosis which manifests as a septicemic disease with meningitis in piglets. Remember, Pasteurella multocida is an agent that causes foul cholera, a high mortality condition in poultry and birds. So Pasteurella multocida itself can do a bit of damage. Well, I think that covers the important bacterial diseases found in the lung of pigs, so let's move on to some of the helminths. Lungworm is a problem in pigs that are raised outside. There are a number of species, with Metastrongylus apri being the most common, but you might see other species including Metastrongylus salmi and Metastrongylus pudendo tectatus. We don't see this much in well-managed production facilities, but it is, it is still seen in pigs that are raised outdoors and wild boars because the intermediate host of this is the earthworm. And pigs like to root around in the mud and eat earthworms, and it's a great way to seed the hog pens as well as ensure infection for many generations to come. Very few pigs ever die of lungworm disease, although it might predispose them to bacterial infections. But severely affected animals do not grow well, which has a negative economic impact on the production. This lung shows both of the characteristic lesions that you will see in lungworms. At the caudal edge of the lungs, in the caudal lobes, you will see gray nodules, which are primarily subplural. Heavy pulmonary infections will show these much lighter hyperinflated areas, which may be found in all lung lobes. Young animals tend to have worms distributed throughout the lung, while older pigs will concentrate them in the airways of the caudal lung lobes. Affected animals are noticeable because of their poor weight gain, their rough hair coat, and their small oversize, uh, overall size. When the earthworm is swallowed, 
the larva will be digested out of the earthworm, will penetrate the intestinal mucosa, and migrate through the lymphatics and the venous circulatory system to reach the lungs. The ones that get to the lungs will break out into the alveoli where they mature, and this infection extends into terminal bronchioles, which is the preferred site for the adults, especially those of the caudal, caudal lung lobes where the bronchioles are of the widest diameter. After about 25 days, they will produce eggs which are larvated, are coughed up, swallowed, and passed out in the feces again to recontaminate the soil. So this is a disease which is common in areas where pigs are raised outdoors with access to soil. Another helminth parasite affecting the lungs is Ascaris suum. Once again, pigs need to have access to soil to continue the infection. And as all Ascarids do, once they are swallowed, the eggs hatch, the larva will break through the intestine and then go migrating through the body, causing lesions in the liver, which eventually will become fibrotic and will be visible grossly as quote-unquote milk spots. And they will also go through the lung as part of their normal migration. And they may end up actually in almost any tissue of the body. Within the lung, you will see multifocal areas of eosinophilic inflammation and hemorrhage as they move through, which eventually will be filled in by macrophages and cleaned up. If you were to look very, very closely, these particular foci might have a slightly greenish tinge in the center of them. And here's one more picture of severe roundworm infection. Clinically affected animals may show respiratory signs such as coughing or uh, a, a decrease in activity during the summer months where the infections are heaviest, especially if they are heavily infected, but this would easily be confused with other conditions affecting the lungs to include mycoplasmal infections. Just a few more entities. This is a lung in which the normal lobular architecture is accentuated by the accumulation of fluid. The entire lung is uh, inflated, heavy, wet, and it almost looks like we have to look through a layer of fluid here in the pleura to actually see the parenchyma. And this is what is seen in pigs who are intoxicated with fumonisin. Fumonisin is one of the toxins that is elaborated by the same fungus in moldy corn that causes leucoencephalomalacia in horses. The fungus's name is Fusarium verticilloides, it used to be Fusarium maniliforme, and it elaborates four different types of toxins, of which Fumonisin B1 is the one that causes the most problems for domestic species. The lesion is not that different than what we see in the horse, except it affects a different organ. The toxin fumonisin alters sphingolipid biosynthesis with alterations of sphingosine and sphingonine concentrations in the kidney, liver, lung, and heart. In the horses, it does the same thing, but in the endothelial cells at the gray-white junction of the brain. And this results in massive vascular change, even in light of minimal histologic change in the ves vessel endothelium, and an outpouring of fluid. Affected pigs develop pulmonary edema and hydrothorax. And here's a good picture of the hydrothorax that we see in pigs that get into moldy corn. It also causes a marked decrease in cardiac output and systemic arterial pressure in these acute cases, which worsens the problems for the pigs. Sows that are pregnant may abort during this phase. If the animal survives or if the dosage is lower and if it goes into a chronic phase, 
Fumonacin in all species is a potent hepatotoxin, and those animals will develop significant liver damage as very similar to what we'll see in other species which ingest fusarium products over the long haul. So acutely, it'll kill them because of its effects on the endothelium, pigs, many organs, horses, just one critical organ, the brain, and chronically will result in fungal damage to the liver. I'm just throwing this one in here. Our last, uh, our last lung for the day is a lung with flat areas of melanin pigment. This is not a melanoma. They're flat, they're not raised. We're not adding cells, we're just adding pigment. And this is melanosis. And pigs are one of the production animals that you see this quite a lot. It can be in any organ and it really doesn't have uh, uh, any significance to it. Um, there is a form of acquired melanosis in certain types of pigs in Sicily, which are, are the result of uh, uh, ingestion by acorns. In these animals, there was melanin discoloration in the fat and the lymph nodes, and it is thought that the high tannin content of certain types of acorns and certain types of pigs will result in activation of tyrosinase and increased production of melanin. Well, that's it for this particular lecture. And with this lecture, I have concluded my lecture series on the gross pathology of swine. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I certainly have enjoyed putting these lectures together and presenting them to you. And I encourage you to continue to look at these lectures on the Facebook page uh, and the Foundation's uh, YouTube channel because we will start to explore the gross pathology of other species. Thank you for your attention, your time, and for supporting the Davis Thompson Foundation.